Okay, great. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nuruddin Jabnoun. Uh, I am a faculty member at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, CCIS, and I will be moderating this event on uh, the situation in Southern Arabia, that's Yemen, or what the Greek and Roman coined as Arabia Felix, literally means fertile or happy Arabia. So this event is co-organized by the Middle East Association Global Academy and the CCIS, and I am honored to be joined today by two distinguished scholars on Yemen, Dr. Nadia Sakaf, a Yemeni researcher with expertise in media and digital safety, gender, uh, sustainable development, and socioeconomic policies, to name a few uh, fields of uh, her area of interest and research. She holds a PhD in political sciences from Reading University in the UK. Dr. Sakaf is an independent researcher while working through the 21st Century Forum, a UK-based nonprofit organization uh, she co-founded. Uh, also, we are joined by Dr. Mansour Al-Maswari from Amman in Jordan. Dr. Al-Maswari is a postdoctoral faculty at Columbia Global Centers Amman. He is a faculty member in the uh, Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Amman University. He taught in uh, Yemen. Also, Dr. Maswari is an English news writer at the Bawaba News. So during the next 40 minutes or so, I will engage in a conversation with our panelists about Yemen since 2011, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A session and during which the panelists will address some questions from the audience. That being said, it's great pleasure to welcome both of you to the CCAS. Though remotely, uh, I would like to open up our discussion by asking you uh, if you can start by outlining some of the causes behind the less successful, so to speak, uh, Yemen unification in the early 90s though the idea of a unified Yemen was a common goal for many Yemenis uh, who lived under both the Ottoman Empire in the north and the British Empire in the south. Should I start? Yeah. Okay, I, I, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nuruddin, for moderating this event. I am so great, grateful to the uh, Georgetown University and Mr. Global Academy for arranging and facilitating this uh, webinar. Thanks due to Dr. Mimi Kark and Coco. Uh, in fact, uh, situation in Yemen is very difficult to describe uh, by Yemeni politicians and experts. And uh, I remember once Abdul Aziz Jubari, the deputy speaker of parliament uh, and the head of the justice uh, and construction party, uh, said in a parliament session in 2014 that if members of parliament and political parties elites are unaware of what has been happening in Yemen, how can others know? He sarcastically shouted, uh, does the president of the republic know what is going on? Or he is like us, know nothing. Uh, this uh, scream from Dr. Abdul Aziz Jubari, a top official in the Yemeni state can describe the, the reality in Yemen. Uh, it was a, a state of relations with the absolute absence of institutions, you can say. And uh, during the last six decades, and, and so in the history of Yemen from 1962, after 1962's uh, revolution, uh, and 1967 revolution in the South, if you look into the political uh, transition in Yemen, Almost all the presidents of Yemen, either in the north or in the south, uh, have been either ousted, uh, killed, assassinated, or put under arrest. Uh, beginning with uh, Abdullah al-Salal, Abdul Rahman al-Iryani, Ibrahim al-Hamdi, Abd Abdullah al-Ghashmi, and uh, ending in Ali Abdullah Saleh in the north. Uh, the same is the case in the south. Uh, so political situation is not better, was not better than in the north. Qahtan uh, al-Shaabi, Salim Rubiya Ali, Ali Nasir Muhammad, Abdul Fattah Ismail, Ali Salman Malbif, all are either have, uh, were, uh, sorry, all were either ousted, killed, or assassinated. And uh, this uh, cycle of conflict in Yemen is a, uh, is a, you can say, a signal of the political instability of, of a failed state, 
And uh, if we take into account Ali Abdullah Saleh ruling period, which is considered the longest period of Yemen, I mean, uh, uh, from 19, which extended from 1978 into 2012, uh, almost 34 years of ruling, uh, pre and post unification. Ali Abdullah Saleh built a one tribe state at the, at the, at the beginning, relying uh, on, uh, on Hashid as, a, as his pillar. Uh, and then one party state after 1990, with the uh, approval of the political diversity in Yemen, and then one family state, Al Ahmar family. Uh, his his regime was a hybrid, blending tribal and mil military methods, resulting in a state of relations characterized by institutional absence. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Hill uh, aptly said. Uh, Yemen is a state of relations, not institutions, with democracy that resembles no democracy anywhere else in the world. And this is a reality. Uh, if, if you look into the, 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 the means Ali Abdullah Saleh adopted during his ruling, you will find that he based on the tribal support and he adopted divide to rule policy among the Yemeni tri major tribes like Hashid, Bakil, and Madhaj. And he relied on Hashid tribe with Abdullah bin Hussein al Ahmar as a speaker of parliament and as his sheikh or boss. And uh, Abdullah al Ahmar used to say that, You are my president and I am your boss. He, he was the guide for Ali Abdullah Saleh. Therefore, he established a tribal state, Shaykhli Republic, which fulfilled the objectives and tailored to fit their own agendas. After that, he established his uh, military support by Ali Muhsin al Ahmar his son, his nephews, and his relatives. Then by building economic uh, economic empire uh, uh, for himself, for, for, for his relatives, and for those who are loyal to his, uh, to his state. After that, he established opposition. The Islah Party, the branch of Muslim Brotherhood, was established as opposition. He himself established, and he kept Abdullah al-Ahmar to hold the post of Al Islah Party in 1990, so that they can encounter the Southern uh, Socialist Party and Southern uh, entities which have been locked upon as uh, Marxists, uh, atheists, and they are not uh, aligning in terms of religion with the ideology of uh, Al Islah Party or Ali Abdullah Saleh. Saleh uh, sought to, to, to have his upper hand in the parliament. Uh, through uh, having the, the comfortable majority in the parliament in a uh, democracy, democracy uh, in a democracy, but not, that is not a genuine democracy. And uh, one of the funny things is that while he was the having the majority in parliament, he kept Sheikh Abdullah Al Ahmar, his boss, the speaker of the parliament. Though Abdullah Al Ahmar was the head of Islah, supposed to be opposition party, uh, a, a game that everyone can understand. Uh, till 2005, Abdullah Al Ahmar, after their second generation, you can say second generation uh, offspring grew up, uh, it became a problem of cake sharing uh, division between Ali Abdullah Saleh and Abdullah Al Ahmar's sons. Uh, uh, they established joint meeting parties in 2005, and in 2006, they pushed. Faisal bin Shamlan to be a candidate for their party in front of Ali Abdullah Saleh in his second term elections. Uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh won the, the election because he is having all the, the means of uh, power. Uh, in 2009, two years before the end of his ruling, the, uh, the, uh, the head of the parliamentary bloc of the General People's Congress Sultan al-Barakani, who is now the head of the parliament or the speaker of parliament, what he said, there must be removal of electoral matter and uh, democracy should be abolished unless Ali Abdullah Saleh is uh, ruling is extended for his life long. And this was the, 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 uh, the last between Saleh and other groups in terms of trust. Uh, after which uh, 2000 Arab Spring uprising in Yemen came as a must. And uh, because of the growing uh, principle during Saleh's regime resembled uh, authoritarian, uh, divide to rule, and a uh, family rule. Uh, since, yeah. uh, I, but, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. 
can can just I interrupt you here? Uh, yeah, there are many authors, um, scholars on on Yemen, uh, and and yeah. argue that there are many other factors also uh, that we have to take into consideration about the demise of Ali Abdullah Saleh regime. Uh, such as the neoliberal uh, economic policies implemented uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Most importantly, uh, I would say the US war on terror uh, that undermined the regime, its credibility, its legitimacy, and also the people's resentments against this kind of foreign interference, uh, either from neighbors, but mainly from, from the US. Uh, and and of course here uh, the six wars in Saada they were very instrumental to uh, the the uh, the erosion of legitimacy of uh, Saleh regime uh, since for example most of the 160 million dollars uh, uh, allocated by the US for the training and counterterrorism of his forces. Uh, were uh, used in those wars uh, in, in, in North Yemen uh, against uh, the Ansarullah movement. So can you uh, elaborate on those external factors, but also those internal factors, economic, socioeconomic choices that led really to the situation uh, that ended up by, by, by the demise of the regime? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Saleh met his end, uh, uh, I mean, met the end he chose for himself. And his poetic justice uh, was uh, an outcome of his cunningness uh, and dancing on the snake's heads, as he used to say, uh, to find himself danced upon at last by the Houthis. And if you, uh, if I ask Coco if she doesn't mind to share the, the, the slides, which can better uh, elaborate, uh, yeah, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I, I, I'll, uh, next one. <laughs> yeah, we have already spoken. Yeah. Uh, if you look into the map first, we will go uh, back for, for to see the map of the Republic of Yemen, uh, to see the sea borders from the Arabian Sea, the uh, Red Sea, and sea case, uh, Saudi Arabia for, from the north, Oman. Uh, uh, see the strategic lo location of Yemen. Saad failed to, to use in order to build a state. And in looking into the social uh, circumstances in Yemen, Saleh used the uh, blend tactics to, to, to govern the Yemeni people uh, by, by, by tribal and military. Uh, Saleh was playing in all uh, and using all against all, as he himself uh, indicated during his ruling uh, for 34 years. Uh, when you look into his relationship with the Houthis, who emerged from Saada uh, district of Marran and the mountains of Haidan, uh, Saleh uh, was in harmony with them for at least 10 years after 1990, uh, because Houthis built their empire from the very beginning based on Ali Abdullah Saleh plans. They established, uh, uh, initially they established the, the believing youth. Can you, could you please share the next slides, Coco? Uh, one more. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, Saleh, uh, uh, Saleh was relying on uh, religious scholars from both uh, uh, Zaydi sect and Sunni sects. Uh, in in Saada, it is known as a stronghold of uh, Zaydism. Uh, Houthis established their uh, entity there uh, after establishing the believing youth in 1985 secretly by Muhammad uh, Muhammad uh, Azam and others. Uh, again, you, you need to go again. one more one, one more slide. Yeah, this is Saleh State tribal state. Yeah, uh, Houthis grew up from Maran Mountains after uh, 2003. Uh, outcry or when Ali Abdullah Saleh visited Saada in 2003 and after finishing his prayer in Al-Hadi Mosque, he found himself with a chant of Hussein Badr al Houthi who uh, founded the the Houthi group uh, which uh, inflicted uh, 
or separated from the uh, believing youth and built a military group uh, to retrieve what he believes to retrieve their divine right of ruling Yemen. Uh, and the conflict went on in this point uh, till it reached the climax with killing the founder, Hussein Badr al-Din al-Houthi, in September 2004. And uh, uh, they got extended from Sabah uh, to, to govern many parts of al Jawf of Hajjah, Amran. And uh, it ended with the storming the capital city in Sana'a. Uh, in collaboration with Ali Abdullah Saleh himself, after he was ousted, uh, he was ousted from the role. Uh, he went back to to use to, to use the Houthis like a Trojan horse in, in collaboration with Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, and that was uh, not a secret deal that uh, they, my, they they planned to use the. But my my, my understanding that uh, the so-called Houthi uh, Ansarullah, uh, when they emerged. Uh, they try to uh, means uh, to oppose this kind of promotion of a kind of uh, radical Sunni religious uh, Islam in uh, the northern highlands of 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 Yemen, uh, and that's uh, one they try to oppose mainly the Islamist party of Al Islah, uh, and and. Of course, uh, which was uh, a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated uh, organization um, founded by the Saudi to fight against, uh, at that time, the communist and the socialist uh, forces uh, in Yemen. So uh, my understanding is Ansarullah is a very indigenous uh, force in Yemen. and. Uh, 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 as I may say, it's uh, a kind of Mokawan uh, Ishtimai, means uh, a local social actor embedded in uh, Yemeni social fabrics. And uh, it's an active member, of course, of the National Salvation Government uh, based in Sana'a uh, since 2015. But uh, let me move to uh, a more recent uh, situation, uh, and especially uh, the the war that started in 2015, and perhaps here Nadia can take over and try to enlighten us about the situation there, and where for where why we I think at least from my own perspective it's it's inappropriate or irrelevant to portray the war on Yemen uh, since March 2015 as a civil war. Uh, as it's often often framed by most of the Western mainstream media, while I think many scholars of Yemen refer to it as U.S.-sponsored war on Yemen, since every bomb dropped on Yemen, from the buster bombing bombs to cluster bombers, are U.S.-made. The intelligence on the targets is provided by the U.S., as well as the U.S. refueling uh, of the Saudi and Emirati aircrafts uh, is American, uh, while I would argue none of the factions have been able to stand against the Sana'a government without the support of regional powers. So uh, can you give us more, uh, I would say, uh, thoughts on uh, the situation that started uh, in 2015 and why we get there? Thank you, Nuruddin, and thank you, Mansoor. In fact, Coco, uh, can you go to the last slide of the um, presentation? The last... <laughs> this is a quick uh, scanning to show you how much Mansoor has prepared for you. Um, but then I'm going to take you to the very end. Basically, the war in Yemen or uh, on in Yemen is, uh, is more complicated than the War of Thrones, the Game of Thrones. And um, the, the difference is that we don't have dragons, we have uh, other kinds of creatures that we're using in our um, conflict. And the, there are so many play players. The war is, um, Yemen has never seen stability for, for as long as I, I've read. And also in history, you can go back and you say, we never had that national identity. So if you ask people, let's say in, in um, Malaysia or in uh, East Asia, they would be of Yemeni descent, but they would say, I am from Hadramut, not from Yemen. So even 
the national the sense of national identity for us here as Yemenis does not exist. So when we say this is a um a social component, well, all of Yemen is a social component. You have people who belong to their tribe first and then to Yemen second, if at all, to Yemen. And we have seen this with the secessionist movements in the south, and we have seen this in Hadramaut, and we have seen this in Sada, and so on. The lack of a national project was actually something that has been in the making for so many years. And also, um, the international players, whether it is regional players or international players, but I um, I have two bones to pick with you, Nuruddin. The first is that we do not say that the war started in 2015. It actually started in 2014. 2015 was when the blockade happened, in the um, decisive storm. But in 2014 is when the coup happened, and I was there. I was Minister of Information mm -hmm. in the technocrat government. <laughs> my my role in, in the minister was only three months. <laughs> so imagine I just started and saying hello, everybody, and then goodbye. And all of that because the coup happened. And it happened because there was resentment towards what the uh, uh, intermediate government couldn't function. But also there was the hunger, the economic crisis. And as you said, Nuruddin, and Mansour was mentioning that everything boils down to food, to people not having enough on the table. And so whenever a new leader comes and say, I will take care of you, follow me, I will do things the way that supports your livelihood, people will follow because we have a problem in leadership. Now, the problem today is that Houthis, for example, they do not represent the leadership that Yemenis want because there is so much oppression and there is so much um, nepotism. Like it's, it's like um, only if you belong to this bloodline that you can rule. And this is so anti-democratic. And even in the South, when they say, only if you belong to this political party that you can have a position, whether it is in even scholarships. And there's so there are so many Yemenis in the diaspora now not being able to return, and I am one of them. I don't feel safe going back to home, to Yemen, to my country. I don't feel safe because I, I know that the people now in power are only war warlords. They are mostly militias. So if you say that the conflict is in Yemen is not a civil war, I challenge you. It has been influenced by international players, yes. Of course, they to them it's a playground. And there is some, the Emiratis are helping the FTC, Iran is helping the Houthis, and the Saudis are helping the international government. And the US only considers it, consider it as a place to sell weapons and um, fight the so-called terrorism. But then if all these players disappear, let's say one day the, inter the world said, ah, we don't want to do anything with Yemen, and they just leave us, do you think Yemen will be stable. Ask any Yemeni. Do you think there will be peace immediately? That Yemenis will say, oh, everybody else is gone. Let's work together. No. Unfortunately, the answer is no. There are so many grievances within the Yemeni texture, within the Yemeni society, that we need at least three decades to work out our problems that we created a lot on our own because we because it, I, I don't know. I feel we as Yemenis do not really love ourselves. We don't love our country. Um, there is a lack of, of patriotism, lack of ownership. And I don't know when a time will come when we put the weapons down and say we will not allow these international players to control us. We will refuse to be puppets for our, our proxy for our international war. And, and Put our hands together and build our rebuild our country. So uh, sorry, uh, I got emotional there. No, no, no I, I I completely understand. I didn't mean 2015 when they started bombing, but uh, I will go back, of course, to uh, 2012, 13, and mainly late 2014 when uh, all those actors were very close to signing that agreement. Uh, but uh, again, uh, what I read uh, from, uh, and I think you, as you were uh, at that time, Minister of Information, uh, I'm sure like uh, you have a kind of uh, insight about uh, what went wrong. Uh, there is the Algerian diplomat uh, Jamal Ben Omar, uh, the UN Special Envoy to Yemen in charge of the negotiation. 
uh, until he came under a harsh criticism, mainly from G GCC countries for refusing to be complying and uh, compliant and 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 giving up on on his role as an impartial mediator he revealed it after his resignation in response to the outbreak of uh, saudi led war which i call us sponsored war on yemen and i am quoting him from the wall street journal of august 19th 2015 he said when this campaign started one thing and notice it that the yemenis were close to a deal that would institute power sharing with all sides, including the Ansarullah, end quote. So, um, and in the meantime, uh, Hadi was an interim president and uh, his term was supposed to last for, for, for two years, I think. And then uh, he has to call for elections uh, while uh, he, he failed to engage, I think, key factions in the post Salah transition. So what do you think about that? I was, um, Coco, thanks, you can remove the slides now. Um, I was part of the uh, national dialogue. Uh, I was actually heading the SADA group. And I was there when they were talking about the federal system. And even the Southerners, the Southern factions, while they weren't all represented because it was impossible to have everybody there. Their vision for separation, their their claims were there, were presented. So I am I could claim that the National Dialogue Conference was a place where lots of people came together and they aired their grievances, but they came together and we had a roadmap. This roadmap included so many things that have nothing to do with politics, but have to do with the new Yemen, as we saw. Things that have to do. We even talked about the rights of the fetus in the womb. We talked about free education. We talked about uh, healthcare. We talked about uh, independent states, uh, state institutions. We talked about everything. But when it came to the politics, we had two controversial issues, which, as you can imagine, they are the South and the Southern provinces. And even with those, we had discussions and we had agreements, and they signed. They signed. I saw them. They signed. With the GPC, one of them would sign, and the next day they would change that person and they would send somebody else and say, oh, no, uh, whatever happened, this is somebody new. And the problem with that is that there were no guarantees. The rules of the political discussions were not adhered by. And so when people broke their promises, they were allowed to get away with it. And this is what Jamal was saying, that. Sometimes he would say, he would put his hands in the air and say, like, I can't help it. If there is no guardian, if there is nobody to say, you said you will do this. So where is the accountability? So Yemen's, Yemen's problem is not that we don't have visions for the peace. Yemen's problem is not that we don't have resources. Yemen's problem is not that we cannot do without the external players. Yemen's problem is lack of leadership. Like you said, when President Hadi was trying to rule, nobody would listen to him because he was mostly isolated. And it's in addition to lack of leadership, it is that the Yemenis themselves have not reached the point when they said, enough, we are now going to go for peace. They haven't. It's, it's like something needs to implode and we are starving. Uh, there are people who are displaced. Um, even the environment in <laughs> fact, I mean, we would say, haram, we, we did like, it's deep. now we have even nature against us with the floods and all of that. But I think it needs to take its course. And in the, in the same time, we don't need to lose hope. I'm, I'm trying to put some element of, of hope here that a time will come maybe in the next 20 years, maybe tomorrow, that we will have Yemenis come back, coming back together, and this is the role of the, the diaspora. And I want to take you to the diaspora role, and somebody like Mansour. Mansour, he is an intelligent, charismatic, uh, highly educated person, and he is now living in the abroad. I'm living abroad. So many Yemenis who are with us today in this, and I, I can't see how many people are there and how many from Yemen. Just give a shout out to yourself. But 
we are longing to go back to Yemen and rebuild it. And I think we will because we're building ourselves in the abroad while waiting for the right opportunity to come. You, you pointed out briefly to the uh, humanitarian crisis. And um, uh, so uh, can you talk about the uh, either you or Mansoor about the implication of the blockade on uh, Yemen's economy, uh, healthcare system, uh, the cholera was running rampant, uh, civilian infrastructure. Uh, I have some conservative estimations that talk about 377,000 deaths by the end of 2021, with almost 60% of the deaths were caused by the lack of access to food, clean water, and medicine, in addition to almost 20 million are in urgent need for humanitarian assistance in 2023. And what are the implications of for example, the designation of Ansarullah as a terrorist organization by Biden administration in January 17th, which will take effect within 30 days. But now we are beyond those 30 days, uh, especially for Yemeni who rely on rem remittances and, and I would say external funds uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, everything coming from abroad. You have... Uh, um that's that's very important for for the people living in Yemen either in the north or or the south so can you talk a little bit about this uh, humanitarian cost of of this this war that uh, uh, is uh, before, you know... before before talking about the humanitarian aspect let me highlight and uh, add to the point two things yeah. Uh, Dr. Nadia has uh, already spoken about <clears throat> the conflict with the Houthis and you raised the idea of Ansarullah. Uh, one thing you need to keep in mind that Houthis is a family rule which claims retrieving the rule of Hamid al-Din, the imam at 19, prior to 1962. Therefore, they are claiming this right not as a political, but rather as a divine right. And Yemeni's conflict with the Houthis and Ansarullah is a term used in 2011 when they joined the Arab Spring uprising. They used the term Ansarullah so that people will not be sensitive to the to the term Houthis. But if you look into the structure of the state under under Houthi areas of control, it is tailored for Houthis, not only Houthis for the 12th Shiite as they have truly co uh, copied the, the, the Iranian version, and they have added their own addition to the Zaydi version of Islam, which was spread in the northern parts of Yemen. Uh, therefore, I, I'd like to drive comparison so that the audience can have an idea about the type of conflict between Yemenis and Houthis. Uh, conflict in Yemen will continue for more cycles as Houthis treat themselves more equal than others. And I mean, the, uh, they are not uh, treating others equally. Therefore, the, so the conflict with the Houthis is based first on this social inequality. Uh, white Americans for long considered themselves more equal to the non-white non people. And that led to the 1861-1865 revolutions uh, and in, in, in 1968 uh, referendums and all these things. Uh, and uh, still, uh, Houthis, Yemenis like African Americans uh, who fought against the, the the white supremacy, Yemenis are fighting Houthis for this point. They have no problem with the Houthis as a family. They have a problem with the Houthi ideology, uh, which is stemmed from their own interpretation of the Islam, thinking that they are a divine family. They are the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, and they are born to rule while others to obey. If you compare to the Jews and Gentiles who th consider themselves the sons of God, while Gentiles are, th are there to serve. Same is the case with the with the uh, WASP group in, in, in the US and in Europe. They mm -hmm. consider themselves a better race and pure pure blood. That that resulted in the, uh, the, the Second World War and the uh, and the conflict in the American society. Same as the case in Yemen. Yemenis have no problem with the Houthis as Houthis. They are part of the Yemeni society, no doubt. But they have a problem with the ideology from which they stem their thinking that 
they are looking into Yemenis. And if you look into the social structure of Yemen, they treat themselves as the, 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 the light of Yemenis. They are the, the, the upper class in the society. They have the privilege to entertain, to rule, and to, to use Yemen for their own uh, profits. Uh, uh, talking about the humanitarian aspect in relation to Houthism, since 2016, institutions under Houthi areas of control, millions of Yemenis are uh, unpaid their own salaries from August 2016. Why? Houthis say the central bank has been shifted into the south. Therefore, you need to ask their internationally recognized government, which serves only as a proxy for the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen. Uh, they are asking Yemeni people under their, their control, 25 million people, millions of them are employed in, in uh, education, uh, uh, educational institutions, healthcare sectors, and all, all employees are working forcefully without payment. The humanitarian aid which came through the United Nations is controlled by the Houthis and is given to those who show loyalty and go to uh, and are mobilized to serve their uh, fronts to, uh, to 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 mobilize the society and others are deprived uh, and in terms of health sector uh, there is no public health sector in their own areas and if there are there are private uh, health institutions which they established to capitalize their wealth within last nine years Houthis became billionaire after they were begging for the basic requirements of life something that you cannot understand because there are two contracting realities uh, absolute poverty among the ordinary people of Yemen and at the same time very uh, boundless wealth that the Houthis have accumulated in these areas. There, therefore, the, the essential point in our conflict as Yemenis, you, you should not think of the those proxies working for Saudi and United Arab Emirates. They are mere like coordination council to to uh, as a as a Trojan horse for the regional intervention intervention in Yemen. And it is because of this regional intervention in Yemen. Uh, Houthis have won and have become stronger. They have doubled their strength, they have accumulated their wealth, and they have established their own state uh, that fits their own ideology. And Yemenis, either tribal uh, structure or social structure, ha have no options. And uh, usually Yemenis have uh, one basic rule. I am my cousin's enemy and the enemy of whoever is enemy of my cousin. And working on this, they are fighting the Saudi-led intervention, not in love of Houthis, but in hate of, uh, of uh, uh, the military intervention in Yemen. Once the war is Yemeni-Yemeni, there are no external factors. Yemenis will never accept Houthis even for a single day and keep it in mind. Now Houthis become Grow, I mean, growing bigger in in terms of international uh, media because of their gallant uh, military intervention in the Red Sea. We totally agree with that in support of Palestine. But this comes at the cost of our suffering. If you see the the the, the I mean uh, daily life in Yemen, it is uh, unbearable. That's something you cannot bear it. You cannot imagine a, a country without public electricity for the last eight years. You cannot imagine uh, a, a, a country without pure water to drink for the last eight years. You cannot imagine a, a, a community in the north, in Hajjah, in Washha, in Kushar, where hundreds and thousands of family, families are using tree leaves to boil and eat because they don't have something, uh, don't have anything to eat. Can Can I... Just add something. Uh, you yeah. refer to uh, the so-called Houthi Ansarullah as um, means uh, followers of the Twelver Shia. My understanding the Zaidi are uh, the follower of the five Imams first and foremost. Second, 
they never define themselves as Sunni or Shia, but only Zaidi. And third, uh, my understanding that they are not running uh, at least the area uh, where they're, they have under their uh, control 80% of the population as a theological, a theological state, rather they're acting within the frame of uh, Republic of Yemen uh, as a political force. Just those are some points that I want to uh, means to raise. Um, now, if we can move forward, uh, just perhaps with one or two questions, if you can talk about the role of uh, the US played uh, in, in this war in Yemen, and mainly if there is any difference between three administration, we you know like Obama administration was the administration that endorsed the war and the Saudi Minister of Foreign Affairs, when he declared the war in Jubair, was from here, from Washington, D.C. So is there any difference between uh, Obama, uh, Trump, and Biden administrations in dealing with Yemen? Can I take that one? Uh, first. <laughs> Would you allow me, Mansoor? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, just sure, wondering sure. if we can shift the conversation a little bit towards the future. Yeah. And um, and while like I understand that maybe many of your audience um, are in the US or are from the US, um, which, uh, which I would like to request uh, the participants, if you have ever been to Yemen, you, you don't count if you're a Yemen. So being a Yemeni doesn't count. If you are non-Yemeni and you've been to Yemen, could you please just say when you were there and what's your impression of, of Yemen? at that time, when was the last time. I would just love to get a sense if you can, um, Nouradine, help us like, get an idea of who knows Yemen or who has been there, really. Just uh, I, I don't know. Uh, just we look online. Uh, if they if like, they just respond. But like the other thing I wanted to, to attract your attention is moving on from the, the why we are wh where we are today and how do we like, make sense of what's going on. Uh, there was a question on the private sector, and I think I believe that the private sector and the civil society are the key to Yemen's future. And I believe that because of the dysfunctional government, because of the war, because of the fragmentation, the Yemeni people are so resilient and so strong, especially the Yemeni women, and they have created solutions out of nothing. They are able to survive and live. And so it's a form of self-governance. They created solutions for themselves. And so I believe that the future of Yemen is going to be very local. It's going to be bottom up. It's going to be in the hands of the communities that stick together, that um, consolidate their efforts in order to survive. Uh, the civil society, the youth, uh, the women-led organizations, the private sector that is able to make sure that there is food in the market despite the inflation, despite the blockade, despite the price hikes, despite of everything. The private sector has been able to work between rival governments with the bank system being so complicated, with the currency system so complicated. And I feel if we give more space to the private sector, to the civil society, to the women-led organizations, to the grassroots organizations, and if we just tell the politicians, we should bring all the politicians and lock them up, <laughs> put them in one place and pull them, Kalas, go, it's not your time anymore. And we should well, have- this is, this is an authoritarian decision, you know. I uh, think I think <laughs> we will need some benevolent authoritarians in the future, or... the, in the middle future where we, because there is no such as democracy in, in uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. There is no democracy in the sense of elections during instability. It's not possible. Let's not joke ourselves. So if you're going to say, oh, OK, let's have a peace agreement and then let's have elections, then you're joking because there's no stability. People are still have a huge distrust with the system. There's a lot of corruption. And then you're telling me that if I vote, my choice will, will mean something. No, we should have some sort of intermediate recovery period where there is some sort of authoritarian, but um, a just an affair and that one that is representing the, the people and the best interest. And like Mansoor was saying that everybody is equal above the, um, uh, in front of the law. And then we have more space for civil society, for, for private sector 
And we should allow these national organizations, such as, for example, the Social Fund for Development is a national organization that has been playing the role of the government in a way in providing services and microcredits and in, in supporting infrastructure projects. Even we have the works organization, the, uh, the public works uh, projects. We have had civil society and quasi-government organizations running the country. So the next phase is for the international community, for the donors, we want the world. If you're listening to us world, please support these organizations bypassing the political parties, bypassing the politicians, and let's build Yemen from the ground up. Well, there is there is one attendee uh, who said like, uh, spent spring of 2001 as Fulbright lecturer in political science at Aden University, a time of optimism. Um, yeah, so let us move to the questions online. I think you answered- for <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Dr. Nuruddin, sorry for disturbing. Yeah, I would like to highlight into the U.S. role in Yemen. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. U.S. has been part of the problem in Yemen, not part of the solution. And U.S. has always locked into Yemen from the Saudi perspective. Thinking that Saudi Arabia is doing its functional job to protect the, the Western interests in the region, they yeah. treated Yemen like something additional to the Saudi file. And Saudi Arabia considered Yemen as a backyard for their own ambitions and fails. Uh, yet, I would like to highlight uh, three notable aspects of the USA in Yemen. And uh, 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 before Houthis took over the, uh, the role in Sana'a, US Ambassador Gerald Feinstein, and still I remember this, as I was in my home university teaching in the class, and he visited our university, met the governor, and during discussions, uh, he was asked about the Houthis and Houthi group chant uh, as an anti-American, anti-Israel sentiment. He laughingly replied, are they serious in wanting to kill us? I don't think so. Houthis are being judged not by their uh, by their actions on the ground, not by their chants, cries, or slogans in mosques or public places. They are not our enemies, and we are. And when we say that they are using the chant for their own uses. Houthis want to appear or want to take the position of being hostile to the United States. This is the U.S. ambassador. Again, he was asked during the uh, uh, National Lila Conference that uh, the slogan, uh, he, when he was asked if he is having the power of a president in Yemen, more power than the president of Yemen, uh, what he said, uh, I think I will not accept the role of a president in Yemen. He said, he said, I don't know whether I would like the job. And of course, it is not my job. But we have a warm relationship with President Hadi and we cooperate with him intensely. Again, during the Comprehensive National Dialogue Conference sponsored by the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador strongly opposed disarming the Houthi group and turned uh, or turned into a political party in order to be part of the political process. He accepted Houthis to be part of the National Dialogue Conference as a group, not as a party, and as an armed group, not as a political entity. Another notable aspect is in the Stockholm, uh, prior to the Stockholm uh, Agreement, one of the dele delegates, media delegates in the, uh, in the Stockholm stated that British, uh, British Foreign Minister Jeremy Hunt left the Brexit discussions between UK and the European Union following 2018 membership referendum to withdraw from Europe and went to Stockholm. In Stockholm, he met Dr. Khaled al-Yamani, uh, uh, former Minister of External Affairs and the, and the head of the legitimate delegation, Yemeni legitimate, and uh, deputy uh, head Dr. Abdullah al-Alimi. Uh, he told them, that there is a United Nations deal that you need to sign. You have to sign. What, what kind of deal? He did not disclose to them. 
على اليماني asked him I cannot sign unless the president gives a note he said don't worry the United Nations Secretary General will speak to the president and you have to sign after two hours Khalid al-Yamani received a call from the president that signed on the deal and uh, the, the draft of the agreement arrived on the seventh day of the negotiations. The, it was uh, sometimes they used to use terms which do not describe the reality in Yemen. That is me, that means U.S. and Britain deal with Yemen from Saudi to to meet their own agenda to serve their own agendas. These are two perspectives I would like to highlight. So. Um... There is uh, there is a question, uh, many questions, but uh, I think one of them you addressed about uh, means business and privatization. But uh, uh, there is one about I think, uh, yeah. What do you think is the role of Yemeni women involvement in shaping the future of Yemen and current peace talks? Um, asking us that is an increase in attention and I think incorporating women in peace talks uh, from UN side. Uh, I think Nadia, you can take that question. Sure, uh, I'd love to take that. That's just because I'm a woman, I take a woman's question. Well, no, I, Anybody yeah. could answer that question. But uh, yes, Huda, thank you so much for that. Um, the, um, in the peace talks, there aren't any women represented. We have track one, track two, Track three, and now we even have track one and a half. So it's like we're trying to find places for women. And so the first most senior track, women are not present, even from the international community side. When you find the delegations, the UN delegation and so on, you hardly find any women even from the Western, let's say, side. So they're not leading by example, let's say that. And the other thing is, when you talk about peace agreement, um, I don't think it's going to happen again top bottom because most of these who sign have no control over reality. So they can sign until they, their hands hurt. Until and unless we have credible leaders who have, who have author, authority over the ground and who have the trust of the people to follow them. But how to get there? Bottom up, you will have to work with middle level leaders, mid to low level leadership. It has to be built up. So I'm saying bypass all of these names that are usually living abroad and try to identify those leaders who are on the ground, who have credibility and who still have control over the, the place where they are, and then start creating peace agreements among them. And we should, there is some, I love this theory. It's called the, I think, the ink spot theory. Have you heard this before? The ink spot theory. So it's uh, it's actually, I think, a military theory. And it talks about if you have a, an ink pen and you have a white sheet of paper and you just throw spots on this page, the, the spots will grow. So the size of them will grow until they merge. So what we need to do is create these pockets of safety, these pockets of stability. And then they become role models and they will grow and they will merge. So what we can do is that we can work locally, we can work at the bottom and create these utopia zones in Yemen. The private sector can play a role, the civil society can play a role, the neighboring countries, if they're honest, they can play a role. And so we can create these safe zones, isolate them from the war in a way, because there is only so much you can isolate. And then when the people there feel this is the where there is economy, there is education, there's stability, there's rule of law, they will flood that area. And then other regions will say, why not us? Why not we be like them? Taiz is an example currently. The Taiz government is the governor is really trying hard to create uh, some sort of uh, development plan for for the Taiz city, although it is under siege. And we could have this in Hadramaut, we could have this even in Socatra. Imagine if, if we have like a very nice place in Socatra. If you have never heard of Socatra, please go Google it. It's, it's the most amazing place. And if 
we can isolate these places and have enough stability there, I think this will create the ink spot, will merge, and we will have um, a solution for the greater Yemen. It will be very slowly, but it will be sustainable. And there will be ownership, it will come organic, and the people will defend it. The people will care that this is uh, their home, their livelihood. And whoever comes from abroad or from the political parties, they will say, back off. I want to I want to live my life. I want my children to be safe. And I want a future for myself. Well, just one word about Sukhadra is uh, now uh, under uh, Emirati uh, control and occupation. And uh, Sukhadra was uh, declared as a unique flora in the Arabian Sea uh, and the World Natural Heritage uh, by the UNESCO in 2008. So it's, yeah, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, Yemen actually has is home to three UNESCO heritage sites. We had Zabid, we had Sana al Qadima, and we even had Marib, the Dama, the queen of Sheba. We have we had queens, we had lots of things that we were so proud of in the past. And unfortunately, yeah. many, many uh, cultural heritage uh, places and locations were bombed and, and, and destroyed. So we still have uh, almost two minutes. Uh, and and I would like to ask each one of you, uh, though, Nadia, you started by talking about the future. Uh, how do you see the future of Yemen? And, and what are some of the key things that uh, you would advise people, this audience, to keep in mind when we talk about Yemen? Mansouri, do you want to take that? Pardon? Well, it's telling like, no, people no what, what to think, what to look for when they... Well, well, see, I'll just, uh, I'll just kick us off. Like, please read. Please. If you want to know about Yemen, read. And read from different sides because you need to make up your mind. You can't take the... The official media is so distorted. Um, unfortunately, as a pro former journalist, I can tell you there's so much propaganda. So you need to read for yourself and you need to, to make up your mind and talk to Yemenis. Talk to Yemenis from all factions. And you can make up your mind, learn about Yemen. And one day you can be there, inshallah. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, I would like... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have... Uh... As per my own perspective, uh, the, the, the possible future scenarios in Yemen. But before uh, I talk about that, I would like to talk about the mainstream media, especially in the West. They, they maintain a negative uh, image about Yemen. And, and they, they, they most of them came to know about uh, Yemen, the Bab and Bab al Mandab only after the, uh, the military actions now. Same as the thing, uh, they, they came to know about Osama bin Laden only after September 11th, 8th. But they didn't know that it was the US CIA who made Osama bin Laden and who used him to fight the Soviet Union in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And it was the US that has established ISIS in Syria and Iraq to have control on the oil sources and to entertain power and authority in the region and to have control and the, the upper hand on its riches. Uh, same is the case with the Houthis. They are playing with the Houthis and they, they have no problem with the Houthi ideology as, as uh, more equal to Yemenis. They have a problem with his pact with Iran. That is their only problem with him. Otherwise, they would give him everything. Now, previously, they delisted him from the, the, uh, the list of, as a terrorist organization. When uh, Houthis blocked the Red Sea, uh, in support of Palestine, they relisted him as a terrorist organization. Uh, they should ask themselves one question. If Houthis blocked the Red Sea in support of Israel against Palestine or against any Arab country, or even to block it in order to lift the, the block it on Yemen, which has been for the last nine years by Saudi-led coalition, would the U.S. list them in the, in the, in the terrorist uh, uh, list? They will not. Uh, therefore, it is not good to know about things after they occupied Iraq for what? For the nuclear weapons. What happened after that? Do they think that Iraqis will forget what America and Britain has have made in in, in, in Iraq? They will not. <laughs> Same is the case in Yemen. Uh, Yemenis will never forget what has been happening now in Yemen because of the U.S. policies. 
uh, they are they are playing their own politics at our own at, at our own suffering. Therefore, uh, for the future of Yemen, I I think that there are four perspectives. That is uh, helping Yemenis to establish their own state of institutions based on freedom, equity, democracy, and social justice. This thing can uh, Yemenis are uh, thirty five million people. Uh, exceed the, their population exceeds the, the the Gulf states entirely, and uh, if you say the the demographic threat to some of the minor states or below states like United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait, uh, they are minority among the minorities in their on their own land, as indigenous people. And in United Arab Emirates, they are nine percent of the total population. Uh, Ninety one percent of the population are coming from other nationalities, the majority within the UAE uh, society is coming from Asia, from India. Indians are half of the population in the United Arab Emirates. Yemen can create a demographic balance in the region because of the population, because of the strate strategic location, and because of the Yemenis who are experienced, who are professionals, who, who are self-reliant, alike those in the Gulf who are reliant on the expatriates to work and progress their own economies. Thank, thank you, uh, Mansoor. I, I'm afraid that we are running out of time. Uh, and uh, I agree with you. I would say uh, Yemen gave a lot to uh, the whole region, most importantly, the Arabic language, uh, but also uh, coffee that we shouldn't forget about it, you know, coming from Yemen. Uh, thank you very much for both of you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Mansoor. Thank you, the audience. Uh, and uh, I hope like, we'll uh, have more opportunities for more interaction uh, in the future. And uh, uh, really, I would like to thank you for giving us this kind of big picture, mainly about uh, the micro dynamic within Yemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So nice of you. Thank you. Bye.